Hey everyone, welcome to Signal Processing with Paul. And in this video, what I want to do is talk about delta functions. For the math people out there, actually delta functions belong to a class of generalized functions because they're not technically functions, but we tend to call them functions anyway. If you remember from calculus, you were probably taught that basically the integral from a to a of any function f of x was zero. And today we're basically going to break this rule. The way we're going to do this is we're going to define a special type of function. So what I'm going to do is imagine the function that I'm going to put some point A, and I want this to be a box. So I'm going to have this be A, and I'm going to have the height of this box be 1 over A. So if we were to calculate the area of this box, what this would basically be is equal to 1 over A times A, which equals, of course, 1. And this doesn't matter where A is. So of course, if I was to, for instance, say, move A over here, what we would get is a taller but skinnier box. And as we keep basically making it farther and farther and farther this way, we end up getting these boxes that get skinnier and skinnier, but taller and taller, but the area is always one. And of course, we want to ask what happens as I let A get as close to zero as I possibly can without actually hitting zero, because if it did hit zero, you would basically be dividing by zero. And this is what we mean by a delta function. We basically want a delta function to satisfy the equation, the integral from <laughs> zero minus to zero plus. So you probably haven't seen this notation before, but is what I'm saying is the integral from like the smallest point over from zero to the smallest point over um, from the left of zero to the smallest point over from the right of zero over my function delta of x dx equals one. So the integral is one because I'm taking the area under the curve, but I'm taking it over the smallest possible thing. And as a result, of course, this is equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity of delta of x dx is equal to one. But of course, this thing is zero <laughs> as we take the limit, the limit as a approaches zero of this particular special function, which we're going to call a delta function, this is what it ends up getting, right? It's zero all the way up until zero, and it's zero as we take the limit all the way from the right until we basically get zero from the right, so, so the smallest area here. And as a result, when we talk about delta functions, we really define them in terms of this limiting process, because once again, you can't really divide by zero, but what we wanna say is it's just really, really small, as small as you could possibly get. And once again, there are a lot of reasons you would want to have a function like this. For instance, if we want to have a probability, uniform probability distribution, or we wanna say, I wanted to create a random variable that outputs probability that outputs a specific number, like a single number, like every single time you're going to get the number two over the real numbers. Well, this is the case where you would actually use a delta function. You would say, all it does is it outputs, you know, if I, if I generate a PDF, a continuous PDF, you would use a delta function to represent this rather than anything else. Because once again, one of our, one of our qualifications for a continuous random variable is that the integral from minus infinity to infinity of my random variable equals, of course, one. So for a uniform random variable, as we really, really shrink, or as we basically say, if, if you know, <laughs> this thing can only output a single number, the only way this is possible is if we have a delta function at that particular point. So this is one way you can use to actually go from discrete to continuous random variables. And you're gonna see us use delta functions all the time because they're very helpful abstraction. There's some other really cool things you can do with delta functions that are worth saying. So usually we say delta of x, and the way we basically show this is we have our axis and we basically put this here with a height of one. Now one thing you can do is you could scale this. So basically if I put two delta of x, basically do is whoop, scale this up by two. The reason you could do this is this is basically due to the linearity of the integral. It's like replacing the height of this with rather than one over a, you replace it with two over a, and now your area not being one was now gonna be two. So you can of course scale these um, by any sort of scalar and that just pops out of the integral. So now the integral um, of any particular number, let's say a times delta of x is one times a. The a just pops out because the integral is linear. The other thing you can do is shift these deltas around. So if I say delta of x minus two, 
what that's going to look like is basically where this thing is always going to pop up is where the argument is zero. So in this case, we've now moved it over two to the right. So one, two, boom, here it is. And usually we don't put a number in front of it if it has height one, if it has unit height. We just kind of draw an arrow and we basically <laughs> draw this little arrowhead here to basically let you know that if you were to technically draw this, it would just, woo, you know, keep going up <laughs> infinitesimally thin, but infinitely tall in the limiting particular case. But once again, for most of the things we care about, we can just use it this way. This is going to be very important because one of the things we're going to do is we're actually going to define delta functions to create a basis for continuous functions. And this will allow us to do things like convolution, super, super helpful. So hopefully now that you understand delta functions, you'll be able to see how we use them to do all sorts of awesome stuff in signal processing. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.